Hello. Games Workshop has been through numerous significant changes over the years, often driven by the particular vision for the company held by certain managers and leaders. And my guest in his 30 year career with GW has worked with most of them. He was responsible for developing the academy that would train new managers, for leading the design studio, and in his final role before leaving the company in 2015, he was Games Workshop's head of e-commerce, responsible for building the new GW and Forge World websites. And yes, we do talk about the latest iteration of Warhammer.com. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Jim Butler. Jim, thank you very much for taking the time to come and chat with me. I wonder if we could start by just exploring a little bit of your time with Games Workshop. So when did you join and what kind of roles did you have whilst you were there? Yeah, thanks, Jordan. And again, thanks thanks for the invite. I have to say I'm a, I think a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome here following on the, the heels of the great luminaries. Uh, but I, I, hopefully what I can do is give a bit more of a kind of um, a mortal's eye view of Mount Olympus through the next hour or so. <laughs> Whereas uh, an ordinary mortal like me working with, you know, Jez Goodwin and, and Rick Priestley and all the people that, you know, were heroes to me. So I suppose I suppose to, to start, I should say, before I joined Games Workshop, I've been playing role-playing games, tabletop war games, um, historical miniatures games, skirmish games since I was 11. So that's around about 1980. Um, so to me, those people were, you know, they were the rock and roll gods. Um, so I, I, I actually went to um, Trent Polytechnic as it then was to do a law degree. I had no thought of joining Games Workshop at the time, but as it happened through mutual friends, because I helped reset up the... Um, uh, the War Games Society, and we played a lot of uh, D&D, a lot of uh, uh, RuneQuest, and some Warhammer. And through that, uh, we um, I, I met two guys who were already working at Games Workshop, only a few years older than me, uh, John Gillard and Andy Jones, became really good friends with them. So my last year of my law degree, I'd been voted in as treasurer, and that was a paid role. It actually paid more than the um, the, the role of Games Workshop uh, offered me, which <laughs> does for a lot. Um, not many people get rich working for Games Workshop, despite what a lot of fans might think. Um, I've been voted in as treasurer. I'd actually been, I'd blagged my way into a master's degree at the uh, university to do international law. Um, and but then I was thinking, do you know what? I shouldn't really extend my life as a student too long. I don't want to be one of those perpetual students. And John just said, look, there's a there's a trainee manager um, post that, that Brian's advertising because Brian Ansel was running the company then. Why don't you go for that? So I did. I got interviewed by um, Don Stallard of, of Warlord Games fame and Chris Harbour. Who should you should you should winkle out Chris from his his bolt hole in North Nottinghamshire. And they interviewed me, and apparently at the end of it, John thought I was a bit of a floppy head student, and he wasn't keen. But Chris Harbour reminded him that when we'd gone to the pub afterwards, because of course you go to the pub after a job interview, um, that I'd, I'd offered to buy the first round, so that I was clearly, a, you know, an okay chap. And on the back of that, they offered me a, um, a, a trainee manager role. So I started as a trainee manager, and of course it was this was 1990. It was a, a few weeks after Italia 90, a few weeks after my last exam. Um, I planned to take the summer off, but then got the call from Helen Morley, who was the office manager, or Helen, Helen King, who she was there, and to say, uh, could you start next week? And I was 21 of the world, got to say no to a grown-up. So uh, so I, I joined. And um, the management trainee scheme was, of course, because it was Brian, and he basically read an article in the Sunday Times that said, you should have a management trainee scheme. They're all the rage, you know, and then done nothing else about it. Um, so there was no scheme as such. There was no mentoring, there was no training. There was no support for it. It was literally a case of go and work there for three months, now go and work there, now go and work there. So it was completely unstructured. And as it happened, it's actually a great way in a business that size of a couple of hundred people. It was a great way to learn the business. It was a brilliant grounding. And it meant that I was one of the few people by the mid 90s, along with a handful of others, who could hold the business in its head. You could see the whole thing. So my, my, um, my payroll number was B0282, which I think means that I was the 282nd employee. So nowhere near as close as Alan, I think it was number six. Um, <laughs> but, you know, still, you know, fairly early on. And I, I, I like to think that I joined just after the, the close of the kind of mythical phase of Games Workshop, as it was entering its classical phase, the kind of <laughs> late 80s to the, the, the growth of the 90s. 
So there's still a lot of myth around, but it was largely grounded in reality. Uh, does that, does that, <laughs> I'd be interested, how does that fit with your um, um, view of Games Workshop and that, that mythic past? Yeah, it's really, uh, I think that's a good way of describing it because there is that earliest, almost that's the prehistory. And then you go into that era of, yeah, the Titans are now walking the earth and we're creating the initial sort of set of games, your first edition of Warhammer, Rogue Trader and this sort of stuff and laying the groundwork for what will become the games workshop that we still see the sort of uh, the the tendrils of as they've grown out and they're sort of yeah, expanded. Yeah, absolutely. If, 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 it reminds me actually, I think I was about three or four weeks in and I was just doing a quick induction in uh, the trade sales department. So on the phones uh, with cigarette and bacon sandwich in hand, because everybody smoked <laughs> Um, phoning up trade accounts, um, but also taking orders from the, I think it was about 20 Games Workshop stores then, it might have been 21. And I heard about this mythical meeting that Brian had had with all of the store managers, got all the store managers together, which I think at that time would have included Lindsay Priestley. And she, I think she was running the Birmingham store then. And they basically sat them down and said, look, we've got this plan to go big on Warhammer. So what we'd like to do is chuck out all of the non-games workshop stuff, the, you know, the jigsaws, the water pistols, the chess sets, and all of the D&D stuff that makes up at the moment about 50 to 60% of your sales and just do Warhammer. What do you think? And of course, they all looked at each other and went, yeah! <laughs> and I think that says a lot about you know the culture of the time, and that, to, to be fair, I think there's still a lot of that attitude left. So that I think you know I wasn't in that room, but I, I joined Games Workshop as that kind of inflection point mm. happened, and I think you know that was very much, as you say, Brian laying the foundations for for modern Games Workshop based on Warhammer. Yeah. Um, so I and please feel free to jump in any questions or you know, challenge <laughs> me on anything. I should say that you know I'm, I'm relying on memory here so it's quite possible i will get names and dates wrong but um my first proper role on part of the trainee scheme was i was i was asked to take over mail order and i have to remember i still remember as that 21 year old saying run mail order you mean work in mail order and they said no no, no you're going to run mail order I said, what, what 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 do you mean and they said well chris bone who was the first um management trainee who i'd met a couple of times chris has been running for three months and now it's your turn and literally that's what happened i went to mail order i met june who was the lady who came in at six o'clock in the morning to open all the letters with the order forms and handwritten orders and notes and ideas for new miniatures and postal um post orders and uh, checks she would bank all the checks and then forward all the all the orders which had had checks and uh, uh, and post orders with them. Sometimes cash you weren't supposed to, but sometimes people would glue some fifty p coins in there. <laughs> and then we'd arrive at about eight o'clock in the morning. Me and it was about eight young lads, about my age, most of them, and we were put on our white lab coats and go out into a corner of the factory, which is where mail order was. And the job of mail order in 1990 was to you know, unfold these order forms, try and decipher what people had written, and then head off into the factory to go and pick the order. So mail order was a picking operation. It was basically a subset of the, of, of the warehouse. And then, you know, parcel all the orders up and send them out. There was one telephone, there was one kind of grimy, big old um, industrial looking phone at the end of the uh, um, table, the, the row of tables, which are covered in packing tape. I remember like that, that thick in packing tape. Um, there was one telephone which would ring a dozen or so times a day and everybody would scarper. Nobody wants to answer the phone because <laughs> A, it took out it, it took out your picking time. So if you if you were answering the phone and taking an order on the phone or answering a rules query, um, you couldn't be packing, and then you, so you couldn't hit the so you didn't get a, a cash bonus. Um, but if you packed, I think it was more than ten kilograms a day, you got a, a kilo of lead free, in, uh, <laughs> right. free product, so, all, all the lead you can eat. Um, <laughs> and and uh, also it meant if people were phoning an order, it meant having to use a credit card machine. Uh, and again, very few of your listeners might remember um, that in those days, um, they had these credit card machines where you put the credit card in, you know, pop, bonk, and, and the, um, they had the, the three-ply um, paper on them. Obviously, you didn't have the credit card, so people would have to read out the number, and you have to use a biro to write it all in and then tear these sheets out and then bank these steps. It's very fiddly. It's an incredibly um, 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 fiddly process. But yeah, so that was my introduction to managing people um, in the Brian era was was uh, mail order. Um, it's 
it's very tempting to relate stories of some of the crazy things that I witnessed Brian doing or saying or other people said, but to be honest, out of context, they just seem like, you know, just uh, they don't make as much sense because, again, yeah. so, the Brian was perfectly capable of saying pretty bonkers things. And he had this, uh, people would talk about the Brian reality, the Brian verse, that Brian would say things which were just true and you had to behave as though they were true, whether they were true or not. But again, you have to be really careful that Brian was literally making Warhammer and building games which were around it in those times. So although although there were some kind of crazy moments, um, it was all part of very much that kind of pioneer spirit, that really feeling of the kind of wild west of breaking new ground. Um, so that was that was my introduction to um, um, to Mail Order, and then I actually did my first stint at the studio in late 1990, uh, working for Andy Jones, who was the project manager there. So I was assistant project manager, or Andy Jones's T boy, as I was dubbed by Wayne England, because we were crammed into the corner of the illustrator's office so again that was i mean you can imagine 21 been a warhammer fan for 10 years and i'm in an office looking at wayne england adrian smith steve tappin who did the inner cover for road trader um paul bonner will be popping in and out i don't think he had a, a permanent seat there but um you know those absolute luminaries was just, just an amazing experience to see that from the inside and that's when the studio was at um enfield chambers in the central right. nottingham and brian that was, was quite a, a warren of of rooms and uh, quite quite chaotic as i understand it right yes very much so it was exactly as you hope and imagine it would be and brian brian was in and out quite a lot of that time and obviously piecing it all together realized brian was um had just brought in tom i don't i genuinely don't remember seeing tom i remember seeing phil gallagher quite a bit and i thought he was the studio manager but i have no idea but you might be able to track down phil one one day um and, and find out from him but it was yeah there was an awful lot going on um, so that was that was my introduction to the studio. It was first, my first stint there. Um, and then for most of the 90s after that, I was either in retail or trade sales. Um, and again, that was that period of rapid growth, um, first of all under Brian and then when Tom took over. It was interesting that um, a few people have kind of commented that they imagined there was a massive change when Tom took over. Um, but the reality is for most people on the ground, it wasn't, it didn't seem that seismic at the time. There was, there was some things which Tom laid the foundations for, which, uh, and the, the box games, the big box games, the, the biggest ones, obviously, I think Alan talked a bit about those, but um, um, it, it didn't seem that seismic a change at the time. If you were in the lower levels, I think it would have been right. a lot more, you know, for senior people like Alan. So that was I'll, Tom I'll Kirby coming there. in taking over the entire company and sort of starting that period of massive internationalization of games mm. workshop right and the expansion of, of the company so was the sort of culturally did was there a sense that okay actually this is a growing company it's really changing in that way or, or was it really just business as usual for for everyone out on the field for people out on the field there, there wasn't really a sense of any major change that came a bit later and it came really uh, um once tom had actually been in the business a couple of years and actually because for the first year or so he was largely um concerned with organizing the um uh, the floating on the stock exchange as well so a lot of that was happening but then also it depended where you were in the business about at what point you encountered the games workshop book and we'll come back to that in a bit because that played a really big role for a lot of my career. And that that is a way of looking at the culture as well. Um, but no, so so my, my I think one thing is that might be worth uh, picking up was after the studio, I went and ran the Reading store. And again, my introduction to retail management wasn't a six week course, crash course in retail management. It was being driven down to Reading by Tony Cottrell. Um, with the address of my B&B on a piece of paper. Scribble. Remember, this is the day before. Actually, then I go, how do I find this place in the middle of a suburb of Reading? There's no internet, there's no Google Maps then. But So he dropped me off at the store and introduced me to a, a, a lovely chap who was the store manager of the Southampton store, who was going to be alternating with one of his guys to come and help out a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then Tony explained that the entire staff of the Reading store had been fired by John Stollard the week before for being rubbish um because he'd come because he'd come in and found them literally all sat with their feet up on the gaming table eating mcdonald's with their mates <laughs> um so he'd fired them all out of hand so the shop had been shut for a few days until i think it was chris from us had to come and open it and uh, this store was now mine and i had no staff um but you know one of the guys from southampton would come down occasionally help me and uh by the way it's the fourth highest turnover store in britain um so 
there you go. There's your story. <laughs> so, and and I, 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 I try and remember. I, mean, I must have blocked a lot out of my mind. But so we quickly, I, I mean, they did send down a couple of people. Uh, I had to fire one of them because he was just hopeless and upset. Lots of people. Um, but eventually did get a couple of members of staff. Um, one of whom was the, the legendary Dave Cross, who's now in charge of the um, hobby uh, studio. But I don't remember anybody explaining to me what the gaming tables and the painting tables were for. I think you were just expected to work it out. Hmm. But when you think about it, that period of Games Workshop is when they're kind of leveraging their competitive language, if you want to use some business speak there, because Games Workshop obviously had the best fancy miniatures range of anybody. But there were lots of other manufacturers around at that time. What Games Workshop was doing that nobody else was doing was creating an environment, um, a club in those stores. And so that was the kind of white heat of development. And I don't think that had anything to do with, with Tom taking over the business from Brian. The big change would be that Tom would internationalize that. So Tom thought, if we can make that work in Reading, we can make it work in Paris or Munich or Baltimore or wherever around the world. That was the big change. But if you were working on the ground in one store, you didn't see any of that. The, the changes were happening much more at the top. Does that, does that make sense? It does, yeah. I mean, it's interesting what you say there about the almost there was no set standards for how to use the kind of features of a store and and it did seem like there was an era where creating a club or a community yeah. feel was like a big part of games workshop's business model almost so and, it, and it, it was and i'm sure i had conversations with people like tony cottrell about that but there was certainly no training program and the reason i knew there was tra no training program is because i helped write the first Games Workshop store operating manual and training program in the mid nineties, about four or five years later. So right. although there was that rapid expansion in the, in the early nineties, there was no real um, structure to it. But I think because we were recruiting from the hobby, uh, you know, pretty much a hundred percent of people in the stores were hobbyists. It was just stuff you knew because you'd got into the hobby because one of your mates had, had shown you. And I, I'll never forget that the thing that really is is so cool to what drives me in, in many ways is that first time you, you someone wanders in, and again, it, it looks like a brilliant piece of marketing. You put the 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 um, cabinets with the miniatures, the lovely painted miniatures in the window, and people walk past and they go, oh, what's that? And they look in that, look in there, and then they kind of look through the window and they see all these, these products on the shelves and they see this big green thing, which is the gaming table. And they wander in. And if, you know, Muggins like me goes, oh, right, you're all right, come in. And you let you come in. You go, all right, you, 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 what, what are you coming for today then? You're, you're Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000. They go, well, I've never been in before. And you go, oh, okay. Well, do, you, do, you want me to, do you want me to show you how to play? So you play a little game with them. And that was great. But the, the thing that always got me, that I just got such a kick out of, was that moment when they'd say, oh, this looks really interesting. I'd like to get into this. So, so where do you buy the miniatures like these? And you go there over here. And he goes, and then they'll go, well, they're unpainted. You have to paint them yourself. And you go, yeah, yeah, that's part of the joint. It means that your army is unique. It's like nobody else's army. It's fantastic. And they go, oh, I, I could never do that. So you say, well, come with me. And you're going to sit down at that painting table, which at that time is a complete mess, I'm sure. You know, paint splatters everywhere. And you give them that miniature. And then they put a couple of base coats on. You can see them going, oh, yeah, this looks a bit rubbish. It doesn't look like anything like the ones in the, in, in the cabinet. But then you get them to put their first wash on. And so you'd get them to paint the skin of a, a model or something like that with a jacket or an orb would be great because you could do the green. And then you drop that ink wash over and you would watch the look in their eyes as they watch this, this magic happen. And they'd go, oh, oh, actually that looks quite good, doesn't it? It's not, not as good as the ones in the cabinet, but they, you could literally see those beliefs in their head. You can hear the, the, you know, the cogs whirring as they go, oh, oh, maybe I could do this. And that's the instant when you knew you'd created and you, you'd minted a freshly, a freshly made <laughs> hobbyist. And um, I don't know if from a commercial point of view, it's like, great, I'm going to make some sales. But, you know, much deeper than that, you felt like you'd recruited another member of that hobby community. And that, I think, still to this day, drives a lot of the people in the stores. And, um, you know, as much as possible, we're trying to do it even on the web store is to create that feeling of, you know, the best hobby store in the world is one that reacts to your needs. It recognizes you, even if you're new, and asks you questions and creates an experience for you, curates an experience that is gonna be perfect for you. So that's 
it, it was interesting that there was so little written down and actually I returned to retail a bit later as an area manager and then became part of the kind of project team with Dave and a few others that wrote the first codex, because of course we called it the codex, um, for training store staff and, uh, and was quite heavily involved in, in uh, delivering that training to store managers. Um, so that, that hopefully sheds a little bit of a light on what was going on there. It was very much learn as we go and lots of conversations, lots of informal learning. Which again sounds very unstructured, but it worked pretty well, didn't it? Certainly did, yeah. And obviously there was that um, a massive expansion over the course of the '90s, and definitely a what seems like a professionalization of of the company and a lot of those training manuals, I guess, and and other things of that nature came in. I mean, you mentioned there as well uh, Tom Kirby's book, and that obviously was like a a set of almost management guidance and principles and aphorisms and stuff like that. I mean, I don't suppose you want to spend a minute just talking about that, the book and the impact of that. Yeah. I mean, it might be jumping ahead a little bit, but um, um, we can always loop that. So, so basically I spent most of the nineties in sales, then joined the studio towards the end of the nineties and, and as a project manager, art manager, and then took over the studio. Then I made my move into the academy where the culture and training and leadership development were full time. So, but it, it well, let, 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 let's pick up that there. We can always come back to the studio later if, if, mm. uh, if there's something useful to talk about there. So Tom, the, the book's been mythologized by many people and, and a lot of people use it as evidence against workshops, some kind of cult. And I, you know, I've, I, I've got a copy. Somebody probably knock on my door and come and reclaim it now. I'm probably not supposed to have it. <laughs> I, I get about seven of them back, but I had so many. But um, the reality is that the, the, the book's a lot more prosaic than people often think. And, and actually what you said is, is very much so. What it really was, um, the, the fundamental purpose of the Games Workshop book um, was for Tom to explain to quite a small group of people that things were going to be different. Because the way that Brian ran the business was the way that you'd run a corner shop he made all of the decisions so it was his company and what tom had realized is if the business is going to grow if it's going to professionalize the word you use is certainly if it's going to become a global company you can't have one person making all the decisions so the single most important message of that job is that management is a real job and that and a lot of it falls in there so managing people is very to do their jobs is completely different to doing that job because like a lot of businesses it grown organically and the people in charge of say the mold making um uh, department were the people who were the best mold makers well of course that's an insane way to to, to run a business because you just if you promote your best mold maker to be the manager of the mold making department you've just lost your best mold maker and probably gained a fairly rubbish manager because that person didn't really want to be a manager they wanted to be the best mold maker in the world uh, and I obviously I'm massively oversimplifying, but what Tom was trying to do was set the foundation for understanding that managing people is a, is a different job altogether. And also that it's, a, and it's very explicit in that it's not a reward. Management's not a reward. It's an onerous job. It's a difficult job with a completely different set of skill set from doing the job. So that was the intention of the book. Um, and he gave it out first of all to quite a small number of people then of course because there was no structure to that lots of people well when can i get a book so it became a badge of rank which was the complete opposite of what was intended to so it's defeating the purpose um and i think i probably got my book in the oh, it's probably 95 90, no 96 97 i probably got mine right. as i was kind of going up the management ranks i think it was probably when i joined the studio but yes i'm pretty sure it was robin dews who gave me uh the first my first copy of the of, of the Games Workshop book. Um, so Tom's intention was that it helped create a culture of responsibility and help people understand that you know the other the other key message in there is how you behave does matter. So your behavior is how you interact with people. And again, you can guess where where that message had come from. Tom, why Tom realized that was so important based on where the business had been in the past. You have to create um, shared responsibility, not have one person who's responsible for all those decisions. Um, so in Tom's, I mean, I, I spoke to Tom at length in the uh, sort of mid noughties about this, and he was quite down on it. And he said, you know, it, it really didn't achieve what I intended to achieve. And I, I said, well, I think it started a conversation, but you can only begin a conversation with the document. You can't you can't facilitate the ongoing. So what Tom did in the late 90s is he set up um, something called the Academy, which initially was intended solely to be a proper structured version of what I joined on a management trainee scheme. So this time you were going to have a course director 
you were going to have a body of knowledge about the business. So it would be a, a kind of mini MBA about, you know, how Games Workshop's business work, a vertically integrated business, which is very different, niche business. It's not a mass market business. So a lot of the lessons from MBAs need a lot of translation to work in niche businesses like Games Workshop. Um, um, so there would be business um, knowledge and there would be leadership and management development, help give people the tools based on a lot of the language in the book. So again, it would be um, tailored to Games Workshop. So I actually, when I was running the studio, I was actually asked to be a mentor of several of people who came in on the first, I think there were three in the end, three cohorts of this uh, management trainee, international management trainee scheme, um, because they went out the way to select people from all around the world because we needed to support a growing business. And the, the management trainee scheme, uh, it was successful in, in many ways. It got some great people out. So Eric Mogensen, who recently left, who was um, senior in the um, um, uh, licensing team, he, he was one of those. In fact, I was his, his mentor. He was my Telemachus. Um, um, so it was successful. But one of the things they found was that um, in creating content to deliver to the managers, so management training, it was a bit wasteful to just deliver that to four people on a, on a on a cohort so they opened it up so that was the beginning of the academy as a leadership development function that worked on behalf of the whole business um, and I moved into that in 2003 but I, I suggest that what we'll do is we'll come back to that later shall I talk a little bit about the time in the studio because I think oh, some, yeah. Some yeah, so there, you took on management responsibility in the studio itself right and the actual helping to lead the yeah. development of new products new games all that sort of stuff yeah so i think i think the reason it hopefully it can shed a bit of light on again the, where the business was so i joined the studio i'm pretty sure it was uh 97 and it was partly because i got to know robin jews who'd taken over the studio alan mentioned he took over and this was this was part of and this is very much tom driving this is starting to professionalize put structure in because one of the things that i think they realized is what the studio was great at in the late 80s, early 90s was that creativity, the kind of white heat of creativity. It was great at coming up with genuinely, um, you know, um, creative and innovative approach to things, but it wasn't terribly structured. And there was no kind of roadmap. Well, of course, if you're Tom and you're trying to build a management team, you're trying to hold heads of sales, especially when that head of sales might be in Canada or Australia or Spain and go, I'm going to hold you accountable for a budget for your next three years sales. Well, of course, the sales are going to go, that's great. What am I going to be selling? Well, they couldn't answer that question. So Robin began the process of, of putting a structure in so that the, there was a, a product pro, a process of designing product and a roadmap. And I really followed on from it. So I joined in 97 as a, initially as a project manager. Um, I was very good to, to manage games day, which was one of those jobs nobody wanted to do. Um, so I got a lot of sympathy, which is good. Um, but very quickly, they asked me to take on the heavy metal team. So uh, 97, 98, I was running the heavy metal team, which again was brilliant. You know, from my point of view, you know, you're managing the best figure painters in the world, you know. So, you know, the, and it was, you know, Jonas Fearing, uh, Stuart Thomas, uh, you know, some real, you know, proper legends of painting. Um, one of the, what was interesting is um, up until that point, the um, heavy metal team had basically painted one of every model that was made. Hmm. So the armies in the studio were basically one unit of everything, which doesn't make a terribly good army. And they recognized this. So this was a bit, well, the thing that I started really was the process of designing um, armies which looked like proper hobbyists' armies. And the first one we did was the BL-10 army, you know, the green Eldar army? Yeah. That BL-10 army, which I think still gets wheeled out occasionally, because as Alan said, is it, it's taken a very long time to replace a lot of those metal aspect warriors, because when a model's perfect, it's really hard to justify just doing a plastic version. When, that, when, when a model can be improved in plastic, there's more of a business case, but it's really hard to improve on perfection. Um, so I project managed um, uh, the guys to, um, to do a hobby army. Um, the intention was to dial down some of the crazy level of detail and, and, and paint in a manner that was more like how hobbyists approached it, which we seemingly failed to do. And all that happened is they just spent far longer on these uh, than they should have done. But what you ended up with was this jewel-like army, which had been painted by other metals, but was actually looked a bit like a, um, um, a proper army. So it had multiples of some units that made sense. Um, the irony was that I actually fought against that army in White Wolf. 
um, <laughs> with the studio's Blood Angels Army, which was one unit, as everything they got absolutely pasted. Um, <laughs> that was probably from a commercial point of view, that was probably as well, mm. because we want to sell the new Eldar. I think the, the Wave Serpent was a, was a new kit. Um, <laughs> Then took over, so so that obviously was uh, hopefully reasonably successful. So then took over the art department, and that was just again, you know, um, so I became Wayne England's boss, which was kind of mad. I was probably you know twenty seven at the time, um, and so I ran the art department and um, and oversaw the move from um, uh, Castle Boulevard to the new site at Lenton. Um, and <clears throat> gradually took over more and more of the the uh, uh, the, the pre-production side as well, so the packaging and stuff like that, for t- miniatures photography. Um, the reason I mentioned the the art thing was, I mean, that was that was the first time I got to work closely with Alan Merritt and John Blanche. And again, that was just to learn to fit John Blanche was just, I mean, what a privilege, you know. Um, but uh, we were talking before kicked off about um, Thomas, one of the first, Thomas Perinen, one of the first projects I managed was Mordheim and led that as art management. So that was the first one where I was pretty much flying solo, I'm running this project. And that was just an amazing project because it was very much part of the opportunity with Mordheim was to really explore the madness and and really dig deep into the um, ideas behind the empire and the craziness because you know, with all due respect to the miniatures designers, the miniatures range for the Empire up until that point had been quite conservative. And I think that's partly because a lot of designers are naturally conservative. So they've taken, you know, clearly the Empire is based on the Holy Roman Empire. The, the idea is it's a, it's a Renaissance German Austrian army with magical bits. But actually, when you look at a lot of the models, they're almost just those Lanschnecks. There's very little fantastical on them. It's, it took quite a long time to get that fantastical vision that was a lot that was coming from John at the time. So John was doing these amazing drawings in the kind of Albrecht Dura style with a kind of you know woodcut style with these amazing things. And you look at the miniatures and go, they're not quite there. They're lovely, really nice miniatures, but they're much more grounded in history. So one of the things that probably people aren't aware of is one of the reasons I think that Mordheim is so enduring for a lot of hobbyists is it was the first time you really saw the craziness of what was possible if you really kind of dial up the crazy the magical elements the fantastical elements of of, of the empire to create a proper fantasy race does that make sense is that you know is that is that yeah i follow what you're saying there and it feels like john blanche's vision was just fully let loose through more time right and, and those Absolutely. fantastic and and strange and weird aspects of things we're familiar with through warhammer fantasy battles yeah. up to that point are really sort of put through a new lens and kind of given a slightly different yeah. aspect. Very much so. I mean, I remember organising a trip to um, 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 the National Gallery in, in London because there was a Jura um, and Franz Howell's uh, exhibition on there. And getting John to stand in front of these things and lecture the team. And that was, you know, this was uh, the Kapinski brothers, Alex Boyd, who graduated, Alex and Nula, who graduated on the training scheme that I'd run when I'd taken over which again was my interest in training and development was really nurtured during that time um you know basically holding a, a, a lecture on how to take some of these archetypal ideas and really push them really go to town with them um and obviously thomas was very you know very central to that as well and um that was also the point where we were starting to develop what we later called the key design process so that Again, prior to the late 90s, the way that new ideas have been developed was very much a kind of personal, organic, random thing. So a person would come up with an idea and we'd develop it. And again, lots of the best ideas of Warhammer and 40K came out of that. But there comes a point where, A, it's more difficult to come up with general, genuinely new ideas, and B, starting to have some kind of coherence about the kind of underpinning metaphysics of the world and having a coherence in design structure and design language becomes more difficult so the 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 the, the structure put in the place called key design a guy who was really central to that who's kind of kind of probably disappeared from the story of games workshop you might want to try and track down there's a guy called gordon davidson so right. i don't know whether you've ever heard that name so gordon was again like me he'd been you know run various bits he'd run mail order he was chief troll for a while um gordon came in just after I did, and he took over the miniatures design, and he 
really started to define the aesthetic of um, of uh, miniatures. And he, Gordon also brought in a lot more of the kind of dynamism. So because because we were starting to explore plastics, we could actually explore much more kind of dynamic posing with multi-part kits. Um, the challenge with single part metal miniatures is the reason a lot of them are doing this or this is because you can only really work in two dimensions. If, if you try and do that, it won't come out of the mold. But if you've got multi-part kits, you can start to explore that. And, and Gordon really come from less of a historical and more of a kind of comic book background. So he brought a lot of that kind of dynamic energy from kind of comic books, the kind of superhero posing that you see. So Gordon and I really working for Robin together as part of the, the first time as a management team, put in this process so that rather than just have random pockets of creativity, we had a process to encourage creativity. And it's kind of that kind of paradox. You think, well, you know, if you put a process in place, it can pay, make people less creative. I think the opposite is actually true. Um, putting in a structure can really help drive real creativity, as opposed to what happens if you don't have that structure is you get this kind of navel gazing kind of creativity where people can disappear down rabbit holes. Mm. The, um, the example that I think uh, sums it really well is if you watch Apollo 13 and um, you look on YouTube for the Houston, we have a problem scene. And so you get a thing where the guys in the, the orbiters say, Houston, we have a problem. And then they get a load of engineers in ties and glasses, you know, people look at me, um, and they put them in this table and they just dump a load of duct, ducting and stuff like that and go, this square thing is what they've got. This round thing is what the thing is. You've got one hour to basically make that fit that all these guys all die. And I think it's a great example of how sometimes really focusing the problem can actually bring out creativity in people. And so what we're trying to do is create a process which has a balance of, yes, there'll be some time for just literally just staring at the sky, thinking of things. But then what we want to do is create that process to really focus everyone together. Um, and in terms of making, you know, designing um, um, products like Mordheim or designing armies, it was really a case of, let's start by stripping away all the detail and go down to the archetype. Who are these things? How do they work in the universe? What powers them? What, 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 what are their, what's their purpose? What are they trying to do? And then layering back up so that what you create is something that has a sense of consistency and, and reality. It feels real. Does that, right. does that make sense? Yeah. And it's interesting the way that you phrase that as well with the, cause there's a, a theme that I think runs through a lot of what I've seen and, and from the conversations I've been having of, that almost that necessity is the mother of invention, right? And that that Absolutely. drives the best kind of creative force yeah. for for creating new games, new miniatures. The the restrictions that existed in the tooling or the materials or the time deadlines, all that sort of stuff, contributed to some really inventive and innovative ideas that then form yeah. the basis of what Games Workshop did. So you've sort of found a way to almost focus the mind and recreate almost a little bit artificially that same kind of level of focus and restriction yeah. to yeah. try and bring out the best uh, of different Yeah, creators. absolutely. And, and that was the first time really we brought in, I said Robin started this process and Gordon and I picked it up and moved it forward. The, there was, the, the deadlines were real deadlines because we'd made a, we, we I, I really pushed forward the internal marketing process so that I was the, I think I was probably the first store manager, um, studio manager to, to put in a series of internal marketing meetings that were structured. What they had before is, is a much more um, informal process of inviting heads of sales in to look at the toys. But what I put in as a process, I look, this is what the next 18 months roadmap looks like. Yes, there might be changes, but this is what we think. These are where the big beats are. Here's what we're going to aim for. So once you've said to that, you know, those heads of sales, we're going to do a new um, edition of, of Warhammer in September next year. Once you've said that, those deadlines become really real. And that's how you get that Apollo 13 moment, because the deadlines are real, because there's a process to, and especially with plastic miniatures, I'm not sure how much you've explored on the podcast about how plastic miniatures are made, but it's a very much an industrial process. And we, we pick up on a bit of that if it's useful or come back to that. Um, but just going back to the sofa with more time in that art process, it was a lot of um, those early key design uh, uh, meetings. So you're working with initial sketches and ideas and a you know, handful of um, illustrators, designers doing mock-ups, the writers, particularly uh, Thomas talking about, you know, what, what's the history behind this? What's the purpose? What, what's, what are the reason all these gangs are fighting in Mordheim? What are they fighting for? Um, but, you know, so for example, we had, we had an art meeting. It was about a three hour art meeting and we spent about half of it we spent about an hour and a half discussing which forms of crucifixion would be acceptable to depict. Right. Um, 
And it was really important because we wanted to convey the madness and the craziness. And of course, you're drawing on a historical background, which includes those kind of things. But at the same time, we didn't want to do anything that was going to be offensive to anyone, um, either on religious grounds or because it was too explicit. Because again, what you're aiming for is something that's adult in theme, but not explicit. So that if a 12, 13 year old uh, picks it up, their parents aren't going to be horrified. That obviously goes. So, you know, I've seen a lot of the conversations on, um, um, uh, that you've been involved in a Twitter mode. Does Games Workshop make things for kids or for adults? And, you know, as far as I can say, as someone who's in retail for 10 years and then in the studio and then back in, in sales, I can say the answer is neither. Games Workshop makes products for people who love those products. And, you know, to a large extent, although there's a, a commercial imperative and there's quite a structured design brief, at the end of the day, the designers are doing stuff that they think are cool. You know that you know that's that's the standard of cool, if you like, is if we all look at it and go, oh, that's amazing. So we're not really designing for anyone. What I would say is, it has to be suitable for. I would I would say high school age. So in the UK, that's what eleven plus. If 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 you'd feel as a parent okay with your eleven year old having that, I think it's fine. So it's kind of not not child safe, but kind of young teen safe. But it's really they, they are, they're not aimed at a person. Mm. They're aimed at, uh, of any sex, gender, identity, age, any demographic. They're aimed at people who think this is cool, and that's always been the case, regardless of that kind of commercial imperative. Does that does that make sense? Right. Yeah. And so is that that would be true across? So there would never be okay. We're going to create a new game or a particular new unit or uh, monster or whatever because we want to target a very specific demographic. It would just be a sort of more general thing, would it? <laughs> It certainly never happened. I think I think you asked Alan about that about when when the um, so the answer to the crucifixions, by the way, was that we wouldn't do a classic Christian crucifixion. You could crucify people on wheels or on a stake, upside down or run, but they would always be in the background rather than the foreground. That right. was our way. If you, you know, I'm pretty sure if you look through the Mordheim art, which I'm still, I think it's one of the projects I'm most proud of. That Mordheim art, I think, is just jaw dropping. It's I'd love to see a. Um, an exhibition of that art. Mm. So I think it stands alone on its own. Absolutely, it's absolutely yeah. fantastic. It was, you know, you had people like Alex Boyd really hitting their stride in that. But um, yeah, um, sorry, what was the question again about Democrat? Yes, you asked Alan about uh, when the business internationalized, were they targeting uh, different demographics in mm. different countries? Um, 99% no. There was the odd conversation, for example, with Jordi, who was running the Spanish business about, could we have a because you have the board of princes which allowed us to pull up Estalia and Tylea. So there was um there was a Christopher Columbo model, for example, that was done for a games day. So you've got very small examples of games day themed things which might be themed to local culture. What I would say is the people in the design studio felt pretty confident that they could take historical and literary and artistic archetypes from Western culture, Western European culture, and play with them to the point that was caricaturing in a way, but still respectful, because they understand. Most of those people are kind of archaeology and history graduates, history of art graduates. I do remember having a conversation in the, I think it must have been the early noughties, with Rick and Alan and, a couple, and John and a couple of others about um, exploring Cafe and uh, Nippon. And it was, it was, a, it was quite um, you know, a casual conversation. And the impression I got, certainly from those guys, was we don't feel confident we know the history and culture of that those countries well enough to do them justice the danger if you don't have that deep knowledge is you do stuff which is disrespectful or just cliched so you know space samurai is just it's just not interesting it's just a cliche it's just a cheap shot i think one of the things that has changed in games workshop is certainly towards the kind of mid noughties um, more and more people with different cultural backgrounds came into the studio. So that's maybe why they felt more uh, comfortable. But if you look at the big project, which ex explored Cathay, it was the Sega project, wasn't it? It was um, uh, Total War. And why was that? It's because those guys actually helped work on the IP because they had access to people who were steeped in the history of China and its literature. So I think one of the things I would say is you should only really... Um, build on historical archetypes if you've if you've done the work I think if you if you understand that to play with those ideas well enough um, that it's respectful of the source material even though it might be taking it into a kind of crazy place does that sure. 
Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, I mean, just, does that ring point. true with what you've seen in the last 20 years in games? Literature? Well, it certainly does. And I think obviously there is in the earlier ranges and some of the earlier stuff in the first iterations of Warhammer fantasy, there are definitely things that are probably more problematic now and maybe aren't yeah. as enlightened perhaps but there's definitely that journey towards i think looking for a more yeah. respected respectful way to explore different cultures and bring them into stories um whether no, or not opportunities were potentially missed there as well to bring in other creators and other other artists who could have contributed those kind of uh, things yeah. I, I don't know but yeah there's definitely well, that, been that journey well, over time i think Quite possibly, but again, I just reflect on the, the, the business grew very quickly. So the people making those uh, the artwork, models, writing, still in their heads were just a little company in a funny mm. corner of Nottinghamshire. So, you know, and, and you're right, there are, there's quite a lot of stuff from the early days of Citadel, which is, is quite problematic. And I don't want to make excuses for those guys, but you've got to remember, they didn't think they were making those for a global market. They thought they were making those models for a handful of people that they mostly knew. Now, that doesn't make that right as an excuse that was still, and I think most of us have come a long way since the um, 80s and 90s in understanding. Um, but you've got to remember, they weren't thinking about a global company selling miniatures in Tokyo and Sydney and, you know, wherever. Um, so I think it, the 90s were very much that growing up period um, mm. um, for Games Workshop. And the, the kind of early noughties that... So the end of that classical period, I suppose, it's it's a strange way because it gets bookended by Lord of the Rings. And Lord of the Rings kind of kind of changes the focus quite a bit, but in some ways it, it shouldn't because what's happening, the underlying structures going on are the same ones. Um, right. But just in terms of Lord of the Rings, so I, I joined the studio, I took over the studio, sorry, after about three years, took over the studio, following on because Robin went off to do Warhammer Online, the original Warhammer Online that was done as a joint venture, which I'm not sure many people even know about because it was never released. Um, are you aware of that one? This was, I, I believe, quite a lot of money was spent on it, right? And it, it sort of didn't yeah. pan out. Yeah, Tom, Tom used to do a thing for the um, the training program for you know the, the initial uh, business strategy module of the management training, and he would do, he would show that the the sales companies looked like this kind of flat structure of of, of kind of pods of individual units. He said, so they're the kind of this shape, and then the factory that's kind of this shape, so you've got lots of people in the, in the, in the packing faces and going up like that. And then you would do this kind of wobbly hole and go, and this is Warhammer ho o online, and this is bottomless pit shaped. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they tipped, they tipped quite a lot of money down that. Uh, and uh, it just showed how difficult it is to do things outside of your area of expertise. I think it's worth mentioning that because it explains a lot of Tom's attitude, in particular in the late noughties and teens. A lot of people see Games Workshop as being very risk averse in that period, and I think I think that's fair. And I think Warhammer Online is one of the reasons why Games Workshop was so risk averse, and Tom in particular was so risk averse. He didn't want to start something which wasn't really core to our what we were great at. And you know, Mark mentioned this in his that we knew that we were the best in the world at making fantasy miniatures and the games that go with them and all the other stuff to help people enjoy them and the, you know, particularly the painting and, uh, painting and modeling side. You know, one of the things that Games Workshop did that was revolutionary was give you everything you need to collect an army and fight a battle. No one had done that before. Um, and that really, you know, that's kind of probably overlooked in terms of the clever business strategy. Again, it wasn't, there wasn't a meeting where they said, right, what we're going to do is this. It was something that emerged. And we said, hang on a minute, when we give people every, everything they need to play, they don't have to go to B&Q and buy some foam board. We find that we sell some of these plastic boards and that's kind of fine. But we sell a lot more toy soldiers and a lot more paint and a lot more brushes because more people, even, even if they don't buy that plastic board, they're going, well, I feel confident to start this hobby now because I know I can get one of those if I need it. And yeah. that's the kind of hobby ranges and the way that they sell are quite complex in that sense that you might have a product which doesn't sell a huge amount on its own, but it gives people confidence to start in the hobby and expand, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, just thinking about sort of moving on with the with your experience within the company, you moved into a place where you were actually helping to build out the web presence for Games Workshop, right? And the stores there and and that yeah. was a way to bring in a lot of new customers, right? And so, so what was the sort of journey with that? Oh, I wish is the answer to that. Because actually <laughs> recruiting people through a, through a, through the website is really tough. So I, I so I I spent the uh, so when I left the studio, it was to be to retrain as a leadership consultant. So I went and learned how to do Myers Briggs and it was graduate course in occupational testing, um, and ran the train programs and really 
what I did after a couple of years work with Tom to kind of really reset them to make sure that what we were doing was suitable for Games Workshop. So we built the kind of internal leadership and management training course. And I absolutely loved that. Then when Tom left and, and Kevin took over, I was already thinking, do you know what? I think it might be time to go back and do a proper job for a bit to make sure that all this nonsense I'm spouting is actually true. Um, and as it happened, uh, one of the big things I'd done is to um, I'd led a project to really professionalize and reform the way we recruited. Because like a lot of companies, we were still in the habit of giving jobs to people, not, not through nepotism, but, but because we thought that a, a job needed doing, it needed doing urgently, and this person was great, and let's get them to do it. And you'd ask them and they'd go, yes, I'll do that. And of course, it doesn't always work out because you haven't gone through that process of going, are they the right person for that job? They might be great at this job, but are they gonna be great at that job? And also, because you haven't recruited them, they haven't had the chance to tell you really whether they want to do it, because most, most people won't say no, because they're loyal and they're loyal to Games Workshop. Um, so I've gone through a process of, of, uh, of, um, of creating a true structure. What we do is we, we do a job specification, which not only had the tasks on there, it would talk about, well, what do you need to be like? What, well, how do you describe someone who's awesome at this job? So it's a bit like a, a kind of mini, um, personality tool which so says you know people who do these jobs well are really conscientious they do these things so i'd done the process and, and and what we'd done is we'd done a job spec for every single job in the in the company it was about 250 different jobs i'd personally done about 130 of these job meetings where you sketch out the thing and then one of the ones i'd done was for this new um head of the web store because they were bringing together the games workshop store the forge world the, the new forge world store which was being put on the same platform as the Games Workshop store with the eventual probably one idea emerging which has just happened a few weeks ago and the Black Library store so it was a new global job so I and I remember walking across the, the bridge to the the the, um, the canteen with Alan and saying you know what that's a really exciting job and he kind of looked at me well you wouldn't think about leaving the academy and doing that and well, I don't know it's quite exciting and then when Kevin took over I realized that that was the opportune moment so I applied for and got that job um so what? So I did that for five years. That was the last job I did before I left. Um, what I would say is, um, hobby stores are really tough to to create. If you think about what a great bricks and mortar hobby store looks like, it's got all the products. It's got as many products as you could hope for on the shelves. Um, and what it's got is staff who are really attentive, but not overly attentive. They're not like you know, do you want fries with that attentive? They they recognise you. And so they recognize whether you're a lifelong um, Age of Sigma fan or a 40K fan, or whether you're obsessed with one army or you like lots of difference, whether you're into the painting or the modeling or, the, or you're a competitive gamer or you're completely brand new. They recognize you and they tailor the experience to you. And doing that online is really tough. And it's doubly tough because a lot of the tools of e-commerce, whether it's the platform itself or whether it's search engine optimization or whether it's the way AdWords work or all those kind of things or social media marketing, they're built for mass market. They're built to sell trainers. Frankly, the internet is built to sell Nike trainers because of course that's where the big money is. Mm. So a lot of the tools aren't really structured. So for example, you know, get into the technical detail, the way that um, attribution models work online, um, for example, is really built for a competitive environment where a customer is looking at five different stores for the same trainers at the same size to work out what was it that made that person buy from there rather than there. And of course that's very different from the hobbyist who rocks up at the hobby site and walks over to their section, which the equivalent would be, you arrive at the homepage, you click on 40K, you go down the side and go, Blood Angels, and then you go, hmm, what am I in the mood for today? I've got 140 products, I probably want to filter them by, do you know what, I fancy another tank. Click the tanks, and they go, right, and now I've got 20 products, and I can, I can sit and browse there. And so, for example, weird things like we found that um, the most common place that people added to basket wasn't within the product page itself, it was coming out and looking at the whole lot and go and then clicking add to cart from the product results view, which is a bit like someone walking up to that blood angel section, picking up three or four different boxes, looking at them closely, staring at the details, reading the blood, then putting them back and then going that one. And it took a lot of effort to figure out what was going because it broke all of the rules of the internet. That's not how people buy. They buy from within the product page. Um, but to just kind of chunk back up, the hardest thing to do is to balance that experience between what new customers need and what existing hobbyists need. So one of the things we found is that I think there's something like 85% of journeys were homepage, pick your category, pick your army, start filtering by unit time. 85% of people arriving at the store went click, click, click. 
And so that, that meant that 85% were pretty much regulars because a new customer wouldn't even know to do that. Because um, I think what the, the analogy I often use is what your existing customers want is an express is like a supermarket. They want everything available. So they want to know that there are thousands and thousands of different options and they want them laid out in kind of aisles with signs above the aisles to go. So when I want to go and find my bit, I'll go to the Space Marines, then I want to zoom into Blood Angels, then I want heroes or tanks or whatever it is. I find my bit really easily and I get left alone more or less. I don't mind the few things popping up to say, hey, you thought about those? You ever thought about Eldar? But if you keep going, hey, look at this Eldar, hey, look at this Eldar, I'm just going to go, oh, you just leave me alone. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go somewhere else. So they want information on tap, on demand, because they know what questions to ask. If you think about a new customer, they want a completely different experience because they have no idea. It's basically like someone walking into Sainsbury's having no idea what food is, because they're just going, what the hell is all this? So what they want is something that's more like a, a museum or a theme park experience. They want to be inspired um, and they want to be given kind of some reassurance that, yes, this looks amazing, doesn't it? But don't worry, we've got you. We're going to lead you. We're going to take you by the hand. We're going to lead you through it. So that when you get to a, an e-commerce experience, it's more like a kind of museum gift shop. Mm. That it's a much tighter range of products which make sense, standalone products that make sense for themselves. Because, again, most of the products on the Games Workshop store or any other uh, hobby web store, they actually don't make much sense in and of themselves. So if you buy a Land Raider kit, what the hell is that? Well, you can't do anything with that kit until you bought some clippers and some glue. And then you've got a kit that's on painters. You need paint and brushes and painting guides. You need knowledge and other products. And then if you want to play a game with it, you need the rule set. You need the rest of the army. You need somebody to play against. So there's so much more to layer. Yeah, because the products don't make make sense in and of themselves. Sorry, the dog needs to join me for this bit. <laughs> sure. so, uh, yeah, so that makes it really tough um, to, to create an experience, which again, what you're trying to do is recreate the idea of having that brilliant sales assistant there. <clears throat> there are some tools we, we, we put in the old version of the store. We did put some things in which um, people didn't notice because of course, if you put segmentation or personalization to web store, people don't really know because they only see their experience. But for example, um, um, and Jamie Forster, I think still with Games Workshop, he led this and did a great job is for example if you arrived at one of the army sections so if you arrived at the uh, the um you know the space marine section or the blood angels section there's a banner at the top that says a bit about the blood angels well one thing that was going under the hood there is if you were a regular returning customer it would it would show you the new releases it would tell you what's new whereas if you'd never bought from that section before if it didn't have any data on you it would show you an introductory want to find more about blood angels click here and it would give you some content some articles things like that those were the kind of things that we tried to do to try and curate the experience. But as I say, it's really tough to do. Um, I mean, I am aware, ironically, that this is happening a few weeks after um, Games Workshop are relaunched. I don't really had any questions about that. All I would say is it's really tough. Um, I can see what they've tried to do. Obviously, some of the technical um, uh, problems they had got in the way of that. What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I guess my my curiosity here is because you you actually mentioned that when you were just getting started in that role, there was already that move to try and, well, presumably put Forge World on the same platform so you can integrate it with the wider GW. Presumably, as other things have developed over time, other sites have developed over time, integrating more of that into a single experience, right? And it seems like that's what this current iteration, the latest version, is 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 still trying to do. But I'm guessing yeah. there's a lot of challenges in in moving forward with that, given that we've seen, you know, the reaction and the, the troubles that the new site has already had in trying to take those steps. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when I took over the job, so this is 2015, they were just building the new version of the um, Forge World site on the same um, e-commerce platform, which right. would begin that process of allowing us to do that. And then I think the next step was then sharing um, um, account data. But even that was, you know, some real challenges there. Um, I, I was the one who led the charge to move uh, Forge World onto um, local currencies um, because when when we launched the the, the new Forge World, so it's still all in in um, 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 Sterling, um, and that in itself was quite a tough project uh, because we recognised that. So the challenge was that, as people will know, the way that Games Workshop prices internationally it builds quite a lot of hedging into the way that the, the currencies translate. So, and, and part of that was also because those, those, um, those, um, those prices were set, the initial prices were set largely in the 90s, 
where the pound is very strong. So, you know, it's, you know, one US dollar, um, so one, one pound would equal, say, one dollar sixty, whereas the actual exchange rate is more like one twenty now. That looks like Games Workshop's doing a ton of uh, price gouging. Mm. Well, there's a few things going on there, and I wouldn't, you know, uh, <laughs> wouldn't argue with people who feel that. It certainly feels that way through customs, so absolutely. But that's part because the prices were set um, back when one dollar uh, was about, it was about one fifty, one dollar fifty to the pound back in the 90s. Obviously, none of us knew that Brexit would happen then. Um, but also, you have to build in some hedging because what you don't want to do is, if there's a big movement, you don't want to raise and lower prices a lot because that's just drawing attention to it. It's really fiddly. It gets really difficult. So you set the prices at a level that you're comfortable that you'll never become unprofitable because of that. So when we did Forge World, it was a really difficult one because we realized that would, that would, if we applied that $1.60, it would reduce in a massive hike in in the most expensive uh, um, products which didn't feel right so i had some long conversations with um guys in uh, manufacturing and in the studio who, who were really controlled price and said how do we kind of balance that out and we i think we picked a, a form that's basically if it was under about 60 70 quid we'd apply the citadel formula which was one dollar sixty per pound if it was kind of 80 to 150 we would have somewhere in between and if it was a big kit we would try and get as close as possible to the real exchange rate plus about 10% for hedging. So that'd be kind of one dollar. So that so that it didn't punish US customers too badly. The other thing we did is make the free shipping much thre threshold much lower. Because what we're saying is, you know, a lot of the the a lot of the the kind of core of affordable kits is kind of 150 to 250 pound kits, because that's the stuff you mm. can't easily do in plastic. So let's make sure that the people buying those are kind of cost neutral. Having said all that, I was on holiday in Portugal with my family when the, when the when the new store launched, and I had frantic phone calls from the head of marketing going, "Ah, oh, Twitter is on fire! Ah, oh, the world is ending!" I was like, "Well, you know, we said we're going to get a lot of this because what people will do is they'll pick up the the worst ones and go, oh my God, there's been a fifty percent uh, price increase on this product here.' Of course, they'll notice that. They won't they won't do a calculation across the the range." Um, and uh, yeah, Twitter went absolutely berserk, and I, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'll carry the, the bad guy off that. What did happen is that sales more than doubled in that first week, and then stayed that way. Because if you're American, ordering in in a foreign currency is a really weird thing to do, and lots of people just don't want to do it. And I quite understand because apart from anything, is you can't find it on your credit card bill when it comes through because you don't know how much you're actually paying. <laughs> so changing to local currencies was a way to actually give people more um, convenience. Um, so that gives you a, an idea. And the biggest, the biggest reason actually why we didn't, um, I was desperate to get a selection of Forge World models on the on the Citadel store, but it's because the resin formulation at that point wasn't toy safe and it wasn't allowable. I think having looked at the store recently, there's actually you can see there's two different types of warning. There's resin and then there's 15 plus resin. Right. And, um, so I think they still probably challenge with some of that because resin is a difficult. Um, um, substance where it's a much more difficult manufacturing process it's much more kind of hands-on much more kind of cottage industry whereas plastic injection molding is very much a kind of industrial process um so it's much easier to scale um but also with resin if you if you um um abrade it you get particles and that you know there's yeah. a lot of lot of difficult problems to solve there so uh yeah so yeah so i you know i, I think the guys I'm sure that when things settle down, people will be able to see the improvements. I think there are some things which do look a bit odd, like not being able to filter by unit type. My guess is that the platform they're using works in a very different way to the old platform. And at some point, some somebody will have a have had a terrible evening where they realize that the data they were trying to port across from the old one to the new one is in a different format and there is no way to make it work. And then they've had to phone up their boss and go, we're going to have to re-tag six and a half thousand products from scratch because mm. the data won't port one to another. Um, so my guess is they're probably madly working about somebody is going through every single product, tagging it, about product type and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that I, a, I would guess that those will reappear at some point. A few of those quality of life things seem to have sort of disappeared a little bit, like the 360 pictures and things like that that people quite enjoy. They're, they're back. I think they're back. Are they back now? Okay. I think so. The 360 are back. And again, that's just, it'll just be a file form, I think. It'll be one of those terrible things where right. everybody thought it was working in a, in a development environment and then you push it live and it just doesn't work. And, and uh, you know, please, please, please be generous to those guys because it's, it's incredibly difficult making. And, and, you know, there'll be loads of people, well, I'm a web developer, I make this work. And I, I, no, I get it. 
but actually it's not just about a web front end. It then has to talk to an e-commerce back end that then has to talk to payment processes. Most web stores are not international in the same way that Games Workshop one is. Even if you go to like Marks and Spencer's and, you know, big well-known brand, they're usually single um, currency. You know, you look at, <clears throat> if you look at Amazon, I mean, Amazon often goes crazy for me and puts me in the American locale, things like that. So the Games Workshop one is doing a lot of difficult things. It's working in is it about, 15, it's working at 21, I think there's essentially 21 different locales, countries. Um, I think there's something like 15 currencies in about five or six languages, and they're being fulfilled from three different um, hubs, one in the UK, one in the US, and one in Australia. It's a big challenge. And I know it's only, a, you know, and, and it, I know it's a big company in some ways, but in, in others, it's still a little war gaming company based in, toy soldier company based in North Nottinghamshire. So um, I'm sure those guys will have a development roadmap and there'll be people beavering away. Um, I can see what they're trying to do is they're trying to square that circle of creating something which is much more friendly to new customers. At the same time as giving your existing customers what they want. Um, it, it clearly isn't quite there yet, but again, I, I, I'd be really interested to see how it develops uh, over the next 12 months um i mean reflecting on your time you're going to say any much more about that because yeah so sure. sorry don what are you going to say well i was going to ask like what what would be those features or do you because obviously you've worked on it you've tried to do it and sort of led that and, and got to a, a level of um comfort for the existing customer base i think right and then obviously they're yeah. moving now to a new platform they're trying to do it uh to whatever the objectives are over the next couple of years, whether it's more integration, whether it's bringing Warhammer Plus in or the other yeah. websites that they've got running, are there any things that you've reflected on over time or looked at now and it's sort of inspired you that you think, okay, that that's the thing I would add or change to really make it hit both of those types of customer? Yeah, I mean, we we never really um, created a really satisfying experience for, for new customers. And again, with that... One of the reasons is technical. So if, if you look, there's, there's tons of fantastic new customer content on the Warhammer community site and the sub sites on that. So the sub game sites, I, part of me as a, as an e-commerce head would have loved to have that content on the store itself. So you go to the space Marine section and it says, if you want to learn more about space Marines, watch this little pop out video, you want to get some more information to there and you're staying within the store environment. The problem with that is if you put all that content in the e-commerce platform it's then a huge amount of data you have to store and it means that every time you click on another page often the store needs to refresh and go right i need to gather everything up well that slows it down massively so the problem you've got is you want to create a an experience which is trying to replicate that in-store experience where you move seamlessly between the gaming table where you're being shown how to do something and the painting table then to a product because that's what you can do in a store and again, that's what you're trying to do online, but it's really hard because there are, you know, websites aren't built for that. The tools are not built for that because hobby stores are quite unusual. Um, and much, you know, as I said before, the tools of the internet are built to sell trainers. That's what everybody gets. Yeah. Um, I, I, do, I think the thing we're most proud of, which, which they don't have in the current store, and again, I, I'm assuming this is a, a format thing that the current platform doesn't support very easily is the um, the painting cartridge on the model page. Um, I was really proud of that. I thought we did a great job with that. Um, and I know that a lot of people have said they missed that, is that when you go to a, a miniatures page, it will give you options to how to paint them and tell you all the paints you need and you can do a one click or you can add any of the ones you want in there. And I think that was a great piece of functionality that I think um, any hobby store should should try to emulate. Um, and again, I, I suspect they're probably working in the background to remake that and it just wasn't in the the minimum viable product in, mm. the, uh, in the, the Argo of e-commerce. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that there'll be more functionality we see over the, the next few months, which uh, which fills some of those gaps. I can see what they've tried to do with the presenting Warhammer as a brand and as almost like a lifestyle, which is, you know, some of that content works really well. It's very arresting. Um, but again, I think that's part of the challenge with Warhammer growing and its appeal growing beyond a kind of hardcore of, you know, dedicated war gamers who would literally clock you know we used to say you know the thing about your 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 most dedicated customers they'll conquer any barrier they'll no matter how hard you make it in fact sometimes making it harder makes them more committed because they feel like they've earned that right and that's i suppose that's why you get a little bit of that that spills out into that culture on you see on social media where people talk 
uh, about people as tourists because they feel like they've earned a right that other people haven't. And, you know, I mean, that brings us back to, I think the reason you you spotted me on, on Twitter was because I and I normally don't get into these spats, but somebody had called Gary Chalk a tourist and I just couldn't <laughs> stop myself. So um, I think that, you know, that kind of brings it full circle in a way. Um, so was there anything more on the e-commerce side? Uh, any any thoughts? I mean, do you have any thoughts? You know, what, what you know, you look at um, a, a hobby store like like the Wyoming store. Is there anything that you think would be would make that experience for you and the customer you are um, better? Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting question. So I think I would fall into that eighty five percent that the the people who go to the site and they're primarily just looking for a specific model or a specific range there's already a familiarity with it typically know what to expect and rarely surprised by things or it's already in my head if i think i want something but then yeah. i imagine a large portion of those kinds of customers are also looking at other websites because they know where else you can get this stuff as well so it, it must be a tough one to kind of create that space for those customers who to yeah. an extent i imagine are doing a bit of window shopping as well uh, yeah there's than... a lot a, a lot of that as well and that again it makes it really difficult to read the data on conversion rates and and you know that a lot of people are looking at that model and then they're buying it from a third party who's offering 20 percent off and um and there's part of it you go well i'd rather have that sale because apart from anything else games which makes full margin so it makes more money um and we get the customer data which to me was always more important we can find out uh, the customer but you, you have to get to the point where you go, well, what do we do? Because if we offer a discount, all that's going to do is reduce our margins on every product we buy. It's also going to really piss off lots of third party customers who are selling our product. And ironically, it won't, it won't necessarily um, offend the ones who are selling online at a discount. The people it's going to really hurt are the mar and par shops who've got a couple of meters of Warhammer in their store, the physical stores. So one of the reasons that Games Workshop does the discount is that it doesn't want to upset all of those um, little customers running game shops. Because if you discount online, you essentially set the RRP at that price. Well, if you've sold a couple of grand's worth of um, of toy soldiers to you know Mrs. Miggins's pie shop, who also happens to have a, a, a row Warhammer, which you can see there was one in a you know chemists and all the you know news agents. There was a florist. There was a florist the other day I saw that had um, a two meter drop of a Games Workshop. Well, you don't want to upset that person because if you discount online, you're essentially reducing the value of the stock they've bought. So that fundamentally is the reason Games Workshop doesn't discount through its own channels. Uh, but also, you know, when you make a model that's going to be in the range for 20 years, if you discount it, you're essentially saying it isn't worth this. It's only worth that. So, you mm. know, there's lots of reasons why you don't see that. So as a head of e-commerce, yes, I was frustrated when, you know, Element Games or Wayland Games got to sell. But at the end of the day, that customer still bought those products so games which still get a share of that profit and i think also my my attitude is if you give customers choice in the end that will maximize their loyalty to the product ranges and the games even if they're not loyal to the store and in the long run what you want is for people to feel like you know feel good about being in the hobby so if they go to a third party and get 20 percent off and they feel good about it in the long run, that's probably better than stopping them getting that and forcing them down another channel. I think choice in the end is what builds more loyalty. Does that make any kind of strange sense? It does indeed, yeah. And I, I think it's it's an interesting point about the sort of third parties and their relationship to the to the base price, if you like, and, and how that might influence that. And uh, I can imagine the retaining long-term value factor is probably a big one, right? To Like you say, for... Yeah. I mean, the average hobbyist will spend but... tens of thousands of pounds over the life of their hobby. So you have to be careful not to get too obsessed with any one sale. Is, and is, I, I is think how... that's a good point, yeah. is There's almost a lot of stuff that's lost leaders, I would imagine. And that, for me, is one of the reasons that I think the sites, the websites are really important. I, I, and, and this is probably where I would love more integration of Warhammer community and the vault that they created for Warhammer Plus and Warhammer Plus itself. Some of that being a bit more cohesive and integrated as an experience because i want the yeah. almost the cultural community aspect of of the warhammer site to be the thing for me less the buying of a of a product in the in yeah. any on any given day i will be buying the product and will be whether that's at games which or somewhere else i'm still part of that world but i kind of want to be uh i want to be immersed in the world of Warhammer through that through those sites, and I guess that's yeah, no, I, a very tough one. To... I'm, I'm sure there's a long term 
um, roadmap to integrate those a lot more, but the technical challenges, until they moved to the new platform, that was going to be impossible anyway. So I'd, I'd be interested to see what happens in the next few years. The, the one thing, having having been the bad guy on um, on um, on the Forge World pricing, I will take credit for um, um, made to order. So that was entirely me. It was me or me, I tell you, or nearly. Um, so um, made to order came out of, which I think has been pretty popular, hasn't it? I think. Oh, it's I fantastic. It's been, yeah, uh, I'm a big fan. And I yeah. think it's, hopefully it's a big thing for the old world as well, the made to order. Yeah, I think it should be. Well, made, made to order came about because I, I found out that Alan had been working on a project to, to essentially make the entire back catalogue available through a separate web store and we talked about how to make that work and I, I you know I did some I did a bit of financial modeling and said it's really tough to have, make this work unless you charge an absolute fortune for these miniatures because what you're having to do is you're having to have all of those molds made and available for customers and we talked a little bit about it and I talked to Jamie who's um, um, the head of operations again he's still there and and we I I honestly can't remember whose idea it was it was either me or Jamie or it's one of those things that just emerged from the conversation I said well what if Instead of having all of it available all the time, if we just, you know, shone a spotlight on a, a little miniatures range or a few miniatures and made them temporarily available. And then Jamie went to talk to the factory and he said, yeah, but they said they'll do it, but they can't make the models ahead of time because they can't afford to be stuck with stock because of the cost and everything like that. It would just make it unviable. And so we said, well, it means we're going to have to say to people, it's going to take what 28 days, whatever, um, because we're going to make, and I, I think I said, well, let's just make a feature of it. Just say we're going to make yours by hand. You can order them and we'll make them by hand, which was true. It wasn't, you know, it was absolutely true. They will be made by hand by one person because um, we might have to re even remake the mold. And so we tried to make a feature out of that. And uh, normally I'm a very consultative manager. I like to brainstorm ideas uh, but on this occasion. I said, and we're going to do Kazakin. We're going to do the metal Kazakin because they're awesome. And, they're, you know, I, I love them and I want some. And it'll be a good way to test it out. So Jamie went, yeah, all right. And uh, we did the Kazakin. And I think we did about a quarter of a million pounds worth of Kazakin in the week they were on sale, which was about three times as much as they'd sold when they were launched. Wow. So... We clearly were on to something. Um, and I th I think, you know, from a commercial point of view, obviously made lots of sense. And it really helped square that circle so that it made the bank catalogue, of it was a reward for long-serving customers who could see some of those models that had been phased out. Um, there was a process to allow the studio to object to anything they didn't want, but I can't remember them. There might have been one or two models that they went, no, we're really embarrassed by that. We don't want it on sale. But largely they were really good about it um, because I think they they got it. It was a bit like, the analogy I used is it's a bit like if you're Ford and you, you release a Model T, everybody knows it's not representative of what you can do now. Everybody knows it's not the new car. It's a bit of nostalgia. Mm. And if you want to collect classic cars, go and buy this Model T. Um, so I think I, I think it was one of those perfect things, which was a, a true reward for long-serving hobbyists, but also made tons of commercial sense, create lots of excitement and sort of gaps. So if you didn't have a new release that week, you could do a made to order so i'm i'm going to claim most of the credit for that but again <laughs> the people who made it work actually did all of the work there but well, so I'm, i think I'm... that's i think that's an example of you start with your hobbyist hat, hat on and go what would i want and then go can we make this work commercially and it's an, another example of that you know if you're pushed and you've got constraints hmm. it, it forces you to be more creative in your thinking and it's definitely worked out i mean like you say commercially obviously a big success i, I think it's a terrific way to get access to that older stuff and and it does feel quite nice and i know there's a certain uh the time limited aspect of it obviously creates a certain uh energy around that sale i suppose yeah. one thing that the evolution that urgency, I would ask for, urgency is, a, is an e-commerce lever yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely Sorry. and and yeah so that's obviously uh uh, a, a challenge i suppose for the for the customer but the thing that i would love to see in an evolution of that is a roadmap for your made to orders or, or some way of voting or some way to know something's coming up voting would future. be great i think i yeah. think a great way to do it is to have some kind of uh, link it to some kind of social um interaction so that people can vote on those kind of things but, yeah so, you know as the as the range grows eventually there'll be more plastic models on that roadmap as well so oh, yeah. yeah it'll be interesting to see that too. Yeah. So I suppose if you introduce voting, then it's it's probably going to be Space Marines and old Space Marines <laughs> every single time. Yeah. But again, I think just going back, you know, to what Alan was talking about, there is uh, there is a commercial imperative, but it's more complex than just making the most popular things. So you know, there would be no justification for making some of the lower selling armies if it was purely commercial on themselves. Mm. But what they do 
is they flesh out the background and um i'm just conscious of time but i'll, I'll just go back to the studio times it might it might be worth talking about the process to design the tau because i think that's a good um sort of thing to finish on to, to look at that process because obviously i i was i was running the studio when when the tau were invented if you like and um, it was very much part of that key design process i've heard an awful lot of stuff, uh, uh, awful lot of opinions about why the tower chosen and why they are where they are. And 99% of them are not fully true, but have a grain of truth. Because again, it's never as complex as one thing. So for example, I've heard that, oh, the, you know, the tower have elements of, you know, you can see some design cues from um, Japanese art and culture. Some, you know, samurai armor is a little bit, you know, those, those square big um, shoulder pads are a, a little bit reminiscent of samurai pads. And, uh, uh, and if you look at their kind of culture and, and history, the background, they're more influenced um, by Eastern um, culture than Western. And so I've heard that so that, that was Games Workshop going out and out to try and get the, the, the Oriental market. And because you go, that's not true. Now, was there at some point a conversation that says, well, if we take these design cues, they may appeal more to you know customers in Japan, but then equally Japanese customers want well, we've got the coming out of our ears. The last thing we want is that we want lounge neck mate. So I think it's always more complex than that. But um, you know, just to, to kind of wrap up there is that that process of designing this was probably a good kind of field test for us the first time the whole key design process worked well we started with an idea and the, the concept was purely we want a new race for 40k which is different to all the others and that was literally the design brief and then you had a small number of um, writers artists and sculptors working together on that to generate ideas and actually that one was quite broad because it was treated almost as a design competition um, so, in fact, actually, the, the the top two ideas that were felt to be the strongest were the, were the prototype Tau and the prototype Crute. And uh, there was quite a heated um, design meeting uh, where we just can, we just can pick and we said, well, do you know, what? these are both great ideas. The, the, the ideas behind them and, the, you know, there was a, a little mock-up model and there were several sketches. Uh, I think Paul Jacob had done the, 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 the Crute ones and they just looked, they both looked great and we couldn't pick. And then someone said, well, look, the idea behind the Tau is that they're much more kind of progressive than the Empire. They're kind of goodies. You know, they're much more classic good guys. They're much more relatable, even though they're aliens. They're much more human in the modern sense of, of, of human society. So actually, they would quite happily work with conquered, if you like, um, races in a way that the Imperium really wouldn't. Because, you know, in the early days, you had this idea they might have that, but, you know, they're filthy Xenos or to be exterminated now. Um, so that that's how the Crute became a subset of the Tau army. And it, it wasn't a clever plan from the beginning. Uh, it was very much the, the, the rigors of the design process that threw up that opportunity. Um, and I think that the reason the Tau won out over the Crute is you could make it work that way, but you couldn't make it the other way. It wouldn't really work to have this kind of barbaric kind of um, tree dwelling primitives conquering the Tau, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. But again, that's not that came out of the design process some of your best ideas some of them are creative ideas just come out of the the structure the rigor and the commitment of those people to a, to the process um, <laughs> yeah. well as a lifelong Tau player i've got to thank you for <laughs> for leading that charge then jim and getting the, uh, getting, well, the Tau, getting the crew but I'll, I'll, I'll finish by admitting to um to something you probably won't like is i I do remember towards the end of the process with the tower um, doing some um, um, play testing and, and really play testing hard. And I, I actually played with my own Dark Eldar army against um, um, Pete's tower and got absolutely annihilated. And uh, I did say, I think you've got those ranges a bit too big. So I did, I did nerf the tower in their first iteration. <laughs> like some, so about half of the, um, the, the range, because they had that, that new rule that allowed them to pop out and pop back in again with the suits. And uh, I said, yeah, you're sniping from the other end of the board. There. So, and we had a great conversation with Pete. I said, well, is it just because you're rubbish, Jim? And I said, it could be. And it could be because I'm just rubbish. But again, he did, you know, he was absolutely dedicated to his craft. He went and then did a little more play test and came back and said, no, I think you're right. I think some of those, those ranges are a bit long. So I did nerf your town, I'm afraid. <laughs> but hopefully I did help help that process to lead to what had become a, you know, absolutely fantastic range of miniatures. And, and really, I think what's successful about the town is they're noticeably 
a very different aesthetic to anything else in 40k so again mm -hmm. if, if, there, if there was any kind of guns i suppose it was a little bit of a sense of the the imperium is very backward looking very steeped in kind of medieval gothic imagery so we want something that's more classically sci-fi that actually proper sci-fi and then so that but that was pretty much the extent of the the tower design brief and the guys then worked through that process to work out all those fabulous details that make them really characterful so yeah and yeah. they so, well, so, I, I think yeah, they're really they them a bit but I'm sure <laughs> yeah and we've changed the rules about nine times since then. <laughs> so, uh... well, I think this is final confirmation that the tower have always been unfairly underpowered. I think everyone will agree with that now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but Jim, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and chatting me through all of your experiences and the time at uh, Games Workshop and the various things you've worked on. So thank you so much for joining me. It's been great. Great to talk to you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you so much to Jim for taking the time to chat with me and sharing his experiences working at Games Workshop. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate it. I thought it was great. Thank you. And if you enjoyed this conversation and want to support me in making more interviews and videos just like this, then you can feel free to check out my Patreon or my Ko-fi or my Discord, which I've now set up, which is open to everybody. I've put links to all of those in the description below. I really appreciate any and all the support that you can offer. It's really, really appreciated. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery.